This is the President McCormack Podcast with your host, Mark McCormack. All right, friends of the podcast, today we have Daniela Fiafia. All right, thanks. Thanks for having me out here, Mark. It's uh, exciting to be on a podcast. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Now, the fun thing about you, you already have your own podcast, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So tell us about it. Um, I started it uh, probably about two months ago. It's called The Success I Built. It's about um, entrepreneurs and just, I'm actually having you on pretty soon. It's yeah, just entrepreneurs and how they built the success they have or even like high level athletes and stuff like that. But yeah. just the their stories of how they came to be who they are. Yeah, no, that's awesome. So tell, um, tell the audience, how did we meet? Do you remember when we met? Yeah, we met at um, Aaron Wagner's Christmas party, and he had this he had this dope ass uh, gold plated jacket and a cowboy hat. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think that's how I yeah introduced myself. I was like, hey, I think I complimented you on your hat, and um, yeah, we just met over there and just kept in touch ever since. Traded off a uh, IG handles and yeah. then. Yeah, yeah, gone from there. No, for sure, man. I, I probably said you probably had the best hair in the place because you do. <laughs> you always do. I always, uh, it's funny, man. I like to give compliments to mm -hmm. people, right? Especially when, and I mean everyone that I say, mm -hmm. but I keep on going to the hair these days. And I think it's because I'm bald, right? But I'm just like, damn, dude, look at your hair. Damn, look at your hair. You know what I mean? And so, because your brother has long hair too, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. My brother has long hair too. Yeah. And it's, well, it's unfortunate because I'm trying to grow like a beard like you got, but it doesn't grow down here. It only grows on up top, so I don't know what's going on right now. Oh, is that what's going on? Yeah. yeah. Well, I guess that's a trade-off, right? Yeah. Can't have everything. So ask, so answer me, how old are you? 26. Yeah, you're still young, and you've yeah. got a lot going on. I I feel like I'm old. Do you? Yeah. Well, oh, I always sure. Wait, wait I till you hit 40, bro. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I always just feel like that. I guess it's always just compare it's always just like comparison. I yeah. always just get locked in, like comparing myself to someone that's younger and then achieved more like, Oh, some jealousy thing that yeah. trying to shake off. They're always working on. Yeah. You'll break that. You'll break away from that crap. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cause you're doing, so one of the things on your Instagram, that's really fun to watch. And it's probably cause I'm in the construction industry, mm -hmm. but it's your business, Chrome and concrete. Right. I mean, that's pretty much the highlighted thing. How long have you, how long, how long did you start the business? Started the business, um, I, think we, I think we just hit 16 months, so about yeah. almost a year and a half. Yeah. And you love it? I love it. It's, I love it. I couldn't imagine being anything else but running business in general. Yeah. It's, it's just a game. It's just a fun game I like to play. Yeah. No, you guys do a fantastic job. I mean, it's, it's and I'm not just saying this, right? I actually enjoy watching almost every single one of your posts just because, Concrete's fun, right? You're on a you're on a job site. It's messy. There's shit everywhere, right? <laughs> and then, but when you guys come in there, I mean, you rebar up, you put your forms in. But then, when you guys are done, it's like this beautifully smooth paint. You know, mm -hmm. it just looks good, right? It looks finished. Oh, you totally. Know? And it's so satisfying. And that's what um, why I've been pushing heavily on like Instagram and TikTok and everything is all the reels and stories is because it's it's so satisfying to us. We see it every day, so it's just like. Oh, it's just another Tuesday, yeah. but it's so, I don't know. It's just so satisfying watching uh, construction work exactly. Yeah. And it's the final product's always the best part. So how'd you get into it? Um, I started working for a guy about two, three years ago and then just learned very quickly because there wasn't, it was just me, him and his son. And so had to learn really fast. And so I liked it a lot. Yeah. And then, um, Finally came around. Then I went to another guy, worked for him for a couple months. He was a really shitty boss. And so that's that's kind of what pushed <laughs> me over the edge of like, because I was always trying to give him advice how to run the company. He was like, oh, I think you should manage it like this and stuff like that. And then just came one day, he told me if, well, if you think you can run a business better, why don't you run your own? And I thought about it for a second. I was like, you know what? He's right. I better... Yeah. I got to put my money where my mouth is. So it's a, uh, yeah. Yeah. It just went from there. That's sweet dude. That's bold. Yeah. And it's, I feel you have to take those kind of risks to risk and reward. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, a lot of people ask me to help them build like stock portfolios or teach them how to like build stock portfolios. 
And we'll talk a lot about valuation, right? Like, how do you value a stock? How do I know if I'm buying it at a good price? And like, honestly, dude, my advice every time is just like, go put some money in the stock market and watch it for a year. Watch how it goes up and down and just see how it does it and then figure out why. And I think starting a business is a very similar, right? You're just like, well, I know the trade. I know how to do it. Mm-hmm. I know business owners do more than just work, right? So like, oh, the best way to do this is just dive in and try it. Get yeah. some jobs, right? Get some money, get screwed a little bit, <laughs> right? You know what I mean? Like exactly. screw up some stuff, have to fix it. And it's like, okay. And then eventually you start getting so confident in that, right? Because mm-hmm. you're like, oh, I know what to do. You know what I mean? I, got, I can send my guys. I know the, their skill level. I know all these different things. And as your business starts to develop, then it's like, you know, it becomes really fun once you start hitting growth mode, right? Where it's like, oh, my guys are good. So we just got to start growing now. Let's go get the sales. Exactly. And it's like the baptism by fire. Yeah. You can't, um, Jimmy Rex has say, said this one time, it's don't be the guy that, Gets ready just to get ready. It's like you have to actually just go do it and then learn and fail. And the faster you fail, the faster you can learn. Yeah. And that's what we're realizing a lot more and more. Me and my little brother, it's our um, company that we started. And yeah. so it's, we're learning a lot um, very quickly. Yeah. <laughs> so how do you like working with your brother? It's, oh, there's no one else I would partner with. It's, oh, really? That's good. Yeah. Um, we're just so close and it's, just happen chance i i hear all the time there's like family dramas and we've gone through that as well as like family and business don't mix and um had to learn that the hard way but there's he's the only one that i actually like we we see the same vision we go about things differently in business which is good because i feel there's sometimes we need to see things from different perspectives but both of our vision is the same so yeah. As long as we get to the same place that we're trying to go. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, how do you split uh, duties? It's um, I do all the sales and marketing, and then he does all the operations. So he manages the crews and um, the job sites. And after we, I start the fires and he puts them out. Right. And so I'll just I'll just make it rain and just get as much work as we can. Mm-hmm. And then it's like amount of work for like ten crews, and we only have like two, three <laughs> crews now. So he's like, ah. Yeah. All right, I'll figure it out. <laughs> yeah. So do you ever go out on job sites or do you, or is it just sales? Um, I go out on job sites yeah. every now and then, yeah, just to make sure it's following what was in contract and stuff like that. And then yeah. making sure we're always trying to learn how to be more efficient with our crews and guys. Yeah. And then if, tell me if I'm wrong, but did you guys just did a job for Big D the other day, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And we're doing another one. Should be this next week or two. It's, hey, there you go, man. No, it's... Yeah, and it, people don't realize that's hard to do, <laughs> right? Because to work for the big boys, like you know, I work with only big boys generally, right? Mm-hmm. That's because I'm in the education market and we do schools and rec centers and stuff like that, right? So they have to be very qualified from the state. But to actually become a subcontractor that they trust and will give work to, it's very difficult to do that because they're they've been getting screwed for years, right? From mm-hmm. little guys that come in low bid, you know, they're they're at the point where they only want guys that are going to like perform. Yeah. And so how, how did you think that you molded your business to, to be able to walk in there so easily? Because the biggest thing when I started, so my previous boss, the reason why we didn't get along is because he would cut a lot of corners because um, there's a lot of things homeowners don't know about construction. And so it's like, oh, it's good enough to get the job done, but it's not good enough to, you're not holding yourself to higher standards. You're not being having good integrity. And so that was the biggest thing about me and my brother. We always ask ourselves and um we only have one name and so that's a mantra i like telling myself so at the end of the day it none of this stuff matters but really what we carry with our name and so yeah i just want to do right by everyone and so i think that's what's helped a lot is we do we try to do the best job for everything and then not just the product not concrete but for everything else is we try to be the best in customer service um satisfaction and then we'll warranty everything we try to make sure everything's done right and if the product's not good that's our fault yeah we don't want to point fingers at like oh no my suppliers did this oh there was there's always something we could have done better like so that's i feel that's what's gave us a good like and marketing i've been marketing like crazy and so yeah. that's how they found me is on facebook <laughs> oh did they <laughs> yeah oh wow dude that's freaking dope either facebook or TikTok. I have to see. Yeah. Yeah. One of the, I forgot which one it was. Well, did you do something right then? That's really cool. Yeah. I didn't know that the big boys would be looking in those, in those areas. 
Yeah, it was a yeah. I guess it was like one of their. It was their project manager. Yeah, he saw it, and so he's like, "All right, we need a new concrete guy." He's like, reached out to us, and was like, "Oh hell yeah, full send, let's go." <laughs> Dude, honestly though, the way that you're describing the way you guys operate your business is very similar to the way that um, uh, I do in, in my subcontracting stuff. Right? It's like people. I want people to feel comfortable enough with my companies that they could actually do a handshake deal. And it will be complete the way that they want it to be complete, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's when it comes down to communication and, you know, meeting spec and like setting expectations at the very start and then performing and then being happy at the end. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, it, it's, it's a lot more rare and rare and rare these days. I signed a contract in Houston one time. It was the largest high school at the time. It was Katie. It was called Katie number oh, 29. Huge. Yeah. Oh dude. I was like, this is a school. It looked like a freaking <laughs> junior college. The contract was 209 pages. 209 front to back and they made me initial every page now some of those you know some of those yeah. commercial contracts have like the schedule in there right which takes up like 20 pages and stuff right and i remember sitting there and i was talking to the guys i'm like guys this is stupid like what the hell is in this contract mm -hmm. i didn't read it obviously it was taking me two days and they're just like i don't know man like every time we get screwed you know or like something happens you know our attorneys add another three pages to this thing and I, you know, so I signed it. I went and did the field measure, you know, did my normal, like get to know everybody and make them comfortable with the company and, you know, set some timelines and do all this kind of stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. And as I'm flying home, I'm, it, it was like just burned in my brain. I'm just like, this is insane. That our society has to live like this. Like we're signing these contracts just to cover everyone's ass instead of just like sitting down and being like, Hey, I need a really good concrete guy. Or I really, I need a really good, you know, athletic equipment guy. Can you guys just get this stuff in and just make it right? And I'll pay you what? you're asking to be paid. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? I mean, contracts should be three pages long, you know, outside of indemnification and the scope, what else is there? You know? Yeah. And I think, I think the, the construction industry really turns to guys like you and guys like me that can keep their word, you know, outside of the contract. Mm -hmm. And you feel that way when you're out there? Yeah. It's, there's so often that we've heard homeowners, they're, they're not comfortable giving us like deposits or anything. Cause like, Oh no, I got burned from the last guy and stuff like that. And so we'll work with that. Sometimes I, a lot of times I do need deposits cause I'm new and I don't have a whole lot of funding. Um, but yeah. we work with the homeowners to make them feel comfortable. Cause if they're not comfortable with working with us, then I don't feel comfortable working with you. So it's, I'd rather just not there's, Oh yeah. No, my next door neighbor had a pool put in with like a, like a pavers, you know, pavers for the yeah. whole like deck and everything. And um, if I remember the story right, I think they gave him like 120 grand to start the thing off. They delivered the pavers and the dude just disappeared. He had like 10 or 12 jobs, did the exact same thing with, gathered everyone's money and split. You know, and it's like, you know, and that was a home that was probably, you know, I don't know, 1.3 million at the time, something like that, right? So it's like 10% of the, of the home they had given to the landscaper to like landscape mm -hmm. the whole thing and put a pool in and all this stuff, right? And it's just like, so then the next landscaper comes along, who's probably an honest guy, you know, then they're like, I need a deposit. And the guys are just like, oh, hell no. You know what I mean? And then it's like, but then it puts you in conflict at the start, right? And it's yeah. like, well, you know, you got to commit to me, I gotta commit to you, like, you know, and so exactly, it's like, yeah. yeah, it's just, it's bullshit. Yeah, and I don't know where, <laughs> I don't know where exactly it started going wrong from, yeah, where it was always just handshakes and people's word was their word yeah. and then started dying off from there and... I'll tell you where I think it came from a little bit. Yeah. It came from general contractors accepting low bid no matter what. Right? Because then you have low bid and these guys just come in there and then they either try to change order them back to like market price, right? Or they fail and then the contractor has to go get another another guy, right? And so then it creates a situation where you have to like mm. You, you, they got you, burned you just, before. They so got they burned, wanted. so then they're like slamming it down. So then the subcontractors slam it back up. Then they slam it back down. You know what I mean? Mm. Then we ended up in this place where we got these idiotic contracts and then just stupid rules about you know pre-qualification and like I mean we just did a job in Las Vegas and my limits down in Las Vegas I think they're five million on my on my general liability insurance for my general contractor's license. And they changed this stupid rule that we had to have a $10 million limit, right? So then we bid this job and they disqualify us because we don't have a $10 million limit. None of my competitors have a $10 million limit, right? We're all, we're all mm -hmm. the exact same, right? And so then I had to go get this thing changed. And I'm like, dude, we're doing like an $85,000 contract with a $10 million <laughs> limit. Like, 
what could go wrong? My hoop <laughs> falls off and blows the building up because it's got dynamite in it. You know what I mean? It's just like no, exactly ten million. You know, it's just crazy. You know, that's, that's crazy. You said that because that's, I mean, that's a very similar thing that happened to me with um, uh, Big D. That when I signed the contract with them because before mine was one million. Yeah. Or, yeah, it was one million, and then in order f to pour driveways for them, they said it has to be three million. And so I was like. <laughs> What the hell? Who, who's who has a three million dollar driveway? Right. <laughs> I gotta see their house. Yeah, exactly. I could turn this thing in and out like ten times before I even hit a million. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's crazy. It's bananas. So, so yeah, I guess I just realized you're doing. So you're doing homes for Big D. Yeah. So they have um they have a residential side um oh. where they only do custom homes, big homes, big homes. Yeah, big homes. Yeah, and they're all all in park city and Heber and all they're just massive. It's yeah. seven bed, eight bath. I'm like, <laughs> they're ridiculous. Yeah. But it's yeah. inspiring. I like seeing the homes like that just cause it's, it's just cool. It's what's achievable. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's way cool. So what were you, uh, with the concrete company, what were you doing before concrete? Oh, I've bounced around to this. So this is actually the eighth, seventh, seventh or eighth business I've started. And all the other ones, they never made money. So pretty much every year after graduate, I graduated high school, I yeah. tried to start a lawn mowing business, didn't pan out. A real estate company didn't pan out. Um, digital marketing. What else? A laundromat. And I think there might be two or three others. And so yeah, I, love <laughs> I think that. I've always had a, the, I've always caught the entrepreneurship bug and then yeah. settled back to wanting to be an employee for a bit and then finally had enough I was like hell no this is <laughs> yeah you gotta go <laughs> yeah i dude i bet the lessons you learned during those were probably invaluable though right i mean way better than college oh yeah 100 percent, 100 percent. because it doesn't because especially when um i was thinking about this today when in business because right now in our business in all honesty we're, we're doing a lot of revenue but we're not doing a lot of um profits and so but we've learned so much in that short amount of time that although, because a lot of our family and friends and stuff like that, it's like, oh yeah, you guys, it's like, how, how are you guys not making money and stuff like that? It's like, well, it's not so much, yeah, the money's one thing, but it's also the person you become because like all the skills and character traits and beliefs I've gained in that year and a half, it's like, I've learned how to market way better than any of my competition in those 16 months. Yeah. Sales is going through the roof. I know how to write scripts. I know how to um, pre-qualify customers and everything. And so it's like, although, we haven't got the profits yet. There's still so many other skills and beliefs and character traits we've stacked up that now we we can flip it around, which st it's stuff you can't learn in college. Like, because yeah. I think we've gone through in this past, we've gone through probably 40, 30, 40 different employees. So it's just been like, okay, now we know exactly how to, what to look for in a form and what to look for in this position and how to hire people. It's people just say, yeah, you just hire someone. It's like, well, there's, you have to make sure their <laughs> qualifications are there. Oh yeah, no, it's hiring is the biggest crap shoot ever. Even if you have an awesome resume, dude, they have to match your culture, mm -hmm. you know, which is huge, right? Especially mm -hmm. a, a, another problem with culture is culture is always evolving, right? I mean, like in my business is like, I always want to get better. Right. So we want to do better things. And you know, and it's like, it's very tempting to stay the same way, Yeah. but really you've always got to be moving that, right. You've always got to be moving to something new, you know, and moving that culture. And so when you hire people, like someone you would have hired 10 years ago, you wouldn't hire now, you know, because they just won't fit the culture and like the way that, you know, people have kind of like, I don't know, settled into their careers and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. It's know? just different. Yeah. And people lie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, especially, oh, yeah. especially in physical labor, like, oh yeah, I've done concrete. And then you get out there and they're just like looking at everyone and you're like, like, bro, well, get that form. And they're just like, you know, or the concrete's like, drying is like, all right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> like, all right. Thank you. See you later. You know, here's your freaking pay for the day. You bugger. Yeah. Yeah. No, exactly. And so there's, um, Warren Buffett. Um, one of his biggest things is when he's acquiring companies or working with people is the three things he looks for is, one is integrity, one is honesty, and I mean, integrity, intelligence, and energy. Mm. And they have to have all three. Because if you have energy and you have intelligence, but no integrity, you'll rip me off. 
if you have intelligence and integrity, but no energy, you'll never get the work done. And then if you have integrity and energy, but no intelligence, you're honest and you're working hard, but we're not going anywhere because you're not very smart. So it's, yeah. so it's as long as they have those three things, they don't need to have so much of the resume for me anyways. And that, that's what I'm, how I see it right now is as long as they have those three things, everything else can catch up. It's like, I can teach you how to write scripts. I can teach you how to lay forms and stuff like that. But yeah. if you're missing one of those three things, then it won't help anyways. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. I've, I'm a big Warren Buffett guy, actually, and I've never heard that. So that was that's good to know. Yeah, so I, 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 I get more in the details with Warren now, though. I'm more like just following the investor the side picks. and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like. I, I'm kind of laughing though because so you know Charlie Munger, right? Yeah. His partner, right? I just, I mean, he's old as dirt, right? <laughs> yeah. He's got to be 98. He could be 100. I don't know. Might be 105. <gasps> but dude, he he just shits all over cryptocurrency all the time, right? And it just makes me laugh because people are like. Cause I'm kind of into crypto. Right. And people would be like, well, aren't you a Warren Buffett guy? Like Charlie and him hate it. And I'm just like, bro, those guys are this close to dying. Right. And they've built this amazing historical legacy. They ain't going to take a freaking run at crypto at the end. You know yeah, what I mean? Exactly. They're just not going to. And I get it. I wouldn't either. If I was 98 years old, I wouldn't touch crypto. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's a 10 year, 10, 15 year run. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? And so, but, and I hate that that's kind of the hot takes on those guys because people are like, oh, they hate crypto. And it's like, would you please go back 15 years and listen to what these guys are saying? Like they are long-term mm -hmm. value investors and it's like the best way to invest. Like people will say to me, like, how, what's the best book for me to read? Right. I think most books are crap. Right. But the intelligent investor by Benjamin Graham, who was Warren Buffett's mentor is the best investing book ever. Right. And it is horrifically boring, <laughs> horrifically. And it's massive. I want to say it's 800, 900 pages. It's like, Holy massive. shit. Yeah. Two thirds of it's about bonds. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's just like, ugh. you know, like I've read it twice and I read it twice because I got bored the first time I read it and I was honest with myself and I was like, you didn't soak this in like you should have. So I went back and reread it and it was, it was in my twenties. It was brutal, but, <laughs> but it puts you in that mindset of like fine value. Really, you know what I mean? The whole, really that's what the whole book's about is how to find value. And when you find value, you just, you just blindly follow it, right? Mm -hmm. Because you don't care what the market's going to do in a year. You care what it's going to do in 15, 20 years. Right. And if you find that value, you know, like, like Coca-Cola, it's one of their most famous um, investments. Right. Yeah. And they were early, you know? And so, but over the years, it's like, I mean, it's one of the greatest companies that's ever existed, you know, but they found the value and they could just kind of sit there and, and, and kind of live on that. You know what I mean? Instead of just going after the quick buck and trying. Yeah. What's hot. Yeah. 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 I mean, if Warren, I mean, Warren's largest position right now, if I remember right, it's Apple, you know, it's like 42% of his entire portfolio. Really? Yeah. But he's way late on Apple. Yeah. Way late. He could have been into that 20 years ago. You know what I mean? But he's, <sighs> he's, uh, uh, man, I want to say he started acquiring Apple within the last 10 for sure. If not in the last five or six, I'm not really sure the timeline, but. So I thought it was, so it wasn't, Ber it's not Berkshire. So it's. So Berkshire uh, Hathaway is the, is the parent company, the holdings company. And then that company is what holds all the other companies. Oh, underneath there. I got you. So when Warren Buffett, um, I mean, they have personal stuff too, I think, right? Like Charlie Munger has his own personal side of investing, but through Berkshire, that's the, that's the holding company that owns the position. So they own like Coca-Cola, American Express, Dairy Queen, Russell. They own a ton of power companies. They own one of the railroads outright. You know, Occidental is the newest one that they're buying into. So, so is that more your, cause you've always been running. So have you always just been running businesses and now you want to get more into just like the investor side and just be I, more of an investor? I started investing in stocks at 21. And so, um, I started with a 401k and, um, which is like mostly mutual funds, big con conglomerates of stocks. It's the stupidest way to invest in the stock market. Um, and then by the time I was probably 24, 24, 23, 24, I'd open a brokerage account, which just means that I'm just buying individual stocks. I, I, so my advice that I give to people is exactly what I did. Exactly. I'm like, just throw some money in there, see how it works, you know? And some went up, some went down, you know, and I just started buying. Like, and what see a, why it went up and why it yeah, didn't. Yeah. So like one of my best investments I've ever had, that's probably my percentage wise is the best investment I did was Amazon. 
And I bought Amazon around 200 bucks a share to 250 bucks a share. And what had happened was Amazon is a behemoth, right? It's been a behemoth yeah. for a long time. And Wall Street devalued their stock through an analysis, right? Because they had like lost money in the fourth quarter because of shipping. And there was this big argument for years and years and years, not to go off on a major tangent, but like how Amazon will never turn a profit. They'll never make money, blah, 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 blah. Well, but their market share was absolutely exploding, right? In the market, right? And it was one of those things where it's like everyone I talked to had a prime account. Everyone I talked to was buying at least one thing a month off of Amazon, right? And I'm like, and in my own business, you know, people would be like, hey, Mark, write a paper or, hey, we need some more of this. And I just get on my phone, bam, 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 order stuff. Right. And it's like, I don't need to go through staples or some other guy that comes in and gets supplies from us. Right. And so I looked at that and I go, you know what, dude, this company's going to be massive. Mm -hmm. And it had gone from like 400 bucks a share down to like 250 or 220 or somewhere in there. Right. So I literally took all my cash and bought it. And it was at the time, it was a huge gamble. Right. Well, I didn't tell anybody, dude. Oh, it's, well, it's split a couple of times. I mean, it went out. I mean, I mean, I'm probably in the 2000% return, Holy. something like that. You know what I mean? And then I started buying it very consistently, right? I started, I put a huge stock amount in or a huge uh, capital allocation in the beginning. And then every month I would buy, I have this weird schedule. I actually buy, I used to buy every single Friday, right? And so, and then I, like the last couple of years, I only I would buy once a month. And so I just, I pick the stocks that I like. And I just keep on buying the same ones over and over and over again. Like one of my favorites is Arthur J. Gallagher, which is an insurance company. Um, I just, I buy it almost every month. And yeah. I just, yeah. Whether it goes up or down, I just think it's, it's going to become the largest insurer in the world, in my opinion. Really? At one point. Yeah. Larger than what's the largest right now? AIG? No. I don't know who the largest is right now. AIG is probably up there. Um, I don't know. They, they do everything though. So they do mm. life, they do property and casualty, they do, you know, Everything. You know, general liability, all that stuff. Yeah. But if you follow them, every, there was a period almost every day they bought a new brokerage. And the way I found out about them is they bought my brokerage, the company that I use for my insurance. And the way that they came in and did it and executed it and kept all the employees that were good. And I was like, oh, that was a good, that was a good acquisition. And so then I ended up just following them. And then, and then my buddy who works there was like, hey, dude, you got to buy our stock. He goes, our, our CFO just came out and gave like a, an internal like rah, rah, rah speech. I mean, they made it public. It wasn't like it was insider stuff, right? But he was mm -hmm. like, the stock's going to quadruple, man. And it pretty much has, you know? And so I just, I buy it all the time. As AJG is the, is the ticker symbol. It's, I recommend it to everybody. I just think it's awesome. But they acquire a business like weekly now. And so they just, they just keep on growing their market share, growing and growing and growing. They had this massive tax break. And instead of doing like a special dividend or holding cash, they just go and acquire businesses. So they're just, they're just merging and acquiring every single day. So, so you just learned all of this investing and stuff like that. And I guess researching all of that, just, just by myself. Yeah. Just mm -hmm. reading. I, every morning I read for an hour. So I normally get into my office. I wake up in the morning and I'll go through my phone and I'll answer emails that are important and sometimes not important. Right. And then I get ready for the day. Sometimes I'll do the gym. Sometimes I'll just go straight to work, depending on what my day looks like, right? And then when I sit down on my computer, I check my emails to make sure there's nothing like on fire, right? And then I normally read for at least 45 minutes, sometimes up to two hours. And I just read either financial news or I read about a stock or I read about a company um, or I'll read about a, an industry or a sector, you know? I like, like sometimes I'll read about crypto, mm -hmm. you know? I'll just kind of stay familiar with the things that I want to stay familiar with. So Occidental Petroleum is the company that I've been reading a lot about recently because their stock's kind of been beat down for the last 10 years and Warren Buffett's buying it like it's, like it's Coca-Cola. I mean, he actually filed with the SEC to get permission to buy more than 50% of the company and they granted it. And so, which is a controlling interest, which means that he would actually control the company. And I just find that so crazy fascinating that I just read about it all the time. So, and then if an investor like Warren Buffett's investing in it, so it's, it gets a lot of attention. Yeah. yeah. It gets a lot of attention. I'm also reading a lot about, um, liquefied natural gas because Russia's in a war. Right. And so they used to supply Europe with most of their liquefied natural gas, which is how they heat their homes and, mm -hmm. um, a couple other things. But I, uh, yeah, I just, I, and America now is basically exporting tons and tons and tons of liquefied natural gas or LNG. It's called LNG when you read about it. And yeah, so I just read about it. I, I wouldn't say I'm an expert by any stretch, but like I. You have uh, a basic knowledge. You, 
Yeah, I have a basic knowledge of how stocks will work and how their earnings affect their long and short term stock price. And so when you see massive sectors, um, like shipping the last two years has been massive, right? Because Mm -hmm. it used to cost about $5,000 to send a container from China to to, from the US. That got all the way up to like $45,000 a container, right? Well, that profit margin increases bananas. It's huge, right? Because the operational cost didn't really go up all that much. Went up a little bit, but not really all that much. Not, not it, yeah. for the amount that they raised. Yeah, but when you 9X your <laughs> your cost, right, or your what you're charging the customer, your revenue, there's a ton of profit, and there is. There's tons and tons and tons of profit. I have one, it's called, uh, I think it's called Starbucks Carriers from China, or no, uh-huh. from Greece. They're based in Greece, but they ship Chinese lanes all the time. Do they have a 35% dividend right now? So if you put $100,000 in there, they're going to give you $35,000 a year just in dividends. Really? And their stock's up and down, but... They'll still give that... Yeah, every quarter, you get, every quarter you get a freaking part of that 35%. The 35% overall for the year. But, I mean, I'm going crazy here on stocks because this is like my... This is where That's I geek now. out. I love this stuff, you know? It's kind of like... Yeah. You, you end up getting into the stocks and you read about them and then you, like, you find that value. Kind of what I was saying with Warren. It's like, damn, dude. Like no one really knows this or some people know it, but they're, but it's not well talked about. And it's like, this is going to be a damn good stock. And so then I start buying that little bits at a time, you know, 10, $20,000 at a time. And then it doesn't take that long. Generally Bet- between four to nine months, you'll start seeing if your trends accurate. Right. But then if you're accurate, you just sit back for five years and bam, all of a sudden your stocks 10 times the price that it was. And you've been getting dividends along the way. And I always reinvest my dividends right back in the exact same company. Really? Yeah. Because if you do that, you'll, you'll exponentially grow. And so it's just kind of my little thing. Like I've never taken profit from my stock portfolio and like bought a car or like went to dinner. You just reinvested I it. Back always in- reinvest it. Yeah. I pay some taxes on it. But I've been able to have enough income come in that I've never had to actually sell stock to pay tax. Mm-hmm. But, but yeah, if you look at my stock portfolio, it looks like this. I mean, it's and so just, you just keep going. Yeah, I mean, the last six months it's kind of gone, you know, tailed off a little bit. But over the long run, it'll, it'll keep going high. But it's, I'm just in massive blue chip stocks, and I just you just see little, you just end up finding little bits of things that make sense. And you said earlier you didn't like with. You didn't agree with the, um, cause when you first started at 21, you went with mutual f- funds. You don't yeah. agree with those. I hate mutual funds, mutual funds, your feed to death, right? So normally someone's selling it to you, right? So they'll put like 1300 stocks in a, in a mutual fund. Right. And all they're trying to do is earn six to 8% a year. Right. And the reason why they do that is because they want safe money in there, institutional mm-hmm. money in there. And then they'll, they'll look you straight in the face and be like, well, you know, we might not have the 20% gains that the market did but we'll protect your backside, right? And then people are like, oh, okay, well, I'm protected on the backside, you know? Like, when, the, when we have a downturn, it won't hit me as hard. Well, yeah, dude, but you're losing like 10% a year. Well, 10% compounding over four years is like, I mean, I can't do the math real quick in my head, but it's like 80%. It's not 40%, it's like 80% because if you lose 10 this year, that's 10% more it would have been next year, right? And it's just yeah. it's compounding and compounding and compounding. So it doesn't keep up the mutual, yeah, the mutual, mutual funds, funds don't keep up with it's like dumb money. inflation. Yeah, no, no. Well, it's not even inflation. It's like it's lost opportunity. It's lost opportunity cost. You know, mm. like when Donald Trump became president, right? The stock market freaking exploded. They love that. They love that we had a business guy in the in the White House that was going to pull down regulation, that was going to spend money. You know what I mean? Like it was just the stock market knew that it was going to be good for the economy, right? Yeah. And so, but if you're just in a mutual fund that's just trying to get 8% where you could have bought freaking Apple and been up like 35% in one year, you know what I mean? It's a, you know, if you have $100,000, you go up 35%, you have 135,000. If you go up 8%, you have 108. Then you go to the next year, if you go up 35% again, oh, right, then it, from 135 position up to whatever 35% of that is. Like, well, yeah, whatever. Right? One, or you go up 8 something. again, now you're only up like 120,000. Where, so you, you know, still, if you go over the span of ten years, if you kept going yeah. after those markets, you're at twenty x the size of the guy at the mutual funds. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. If you listen to anyone that understands compounding interest, like most of the major guys on Wall Street or investors, they hammer on compounding interest because that's where your like exponential growth comes from. It's not the 
it's not what it does in a year or even five years. It's like, how, how can I compound this interest? And that's why people like dividend paying stocks, because as, as that dividend comes in, you just take it and rebuy the stock, mm-hmm. right? And then you just, your stock shares increase and increase and increase over years. And then those dividend stocks generally, cause they're well ran businesses, they increase their dividend at the same time. Now it's, it's their, their slow growth, right? But as they compound, it looks like a hockey stick. Right. Mm. So by the time you're 65, 70, 75 years old, if you've never taken your money out of it, they're self-sustaining like hyper growth stocks. Really? If you were to go back again, would you at 21, would you focus back on running your businesses again or go headstrong more and in, into investing in stocks? Both. Yeah. <laughs> you can run businesses and buy stock at the same time. So, well, I guess because to yeah, answer your question, okay. I would have put more money in stocks. Mm. Yeah, but to to be honest, in my world, I put a lot of money in stocks because I didn't have time to like go buy a duplex. I didn't have time to like start some side hustle, and I don't believe in diversification. I think diversification is bullshit. I don't think you need to be in like fifty. 15 different things and like just spread your time super thin, right? I think you need to focus on what you're like your business, Grow My Concrete, right? You need to grow that thing to 30, 40 million dollars in revenue as fast as you can. Now, you take your profits along the way, those profits you'll invest in certain things, right? But they need to be management free things, right? Like stocks, okay, not yes. something like trying to start, okay, now I'm gonna go try and start this um, yeah, like I'm gonna go software start, company at the know. same time. It's like, no, because you can't serve two masters, so you end up breaking <laughs> off of that, right? So people like me who own multiple businesses, I have key people that kind of run those businesses and I'm more advising the business more than I'm actually running them, right? And then sometimes certain businesses I am running and those, they either explode to where I can put someone in place or I have good partners that help run it or I kill it, right? Mm. Kill it by selling it or just ending it, right? Because it ends up sucking so much time away from you that you're not, you're actually really not growing your net worth every year like you really could. You're you're just like spinning your wheels in these like little startup things. Like I freaking hate startups. Like I'm like past doing startups because, um, I don't know, they're, they're just, they're a pain in the ass. They just take too much time. Now, I'd, I'd put money in a startup that someone else was running if it was a really, really good opportunity, but I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't start my own. Mm-hmm. Like if you, if we Going to back dinner, to square yeah. one and then like if you right. and I went to dinner and you're like, bro, we got to start a software company. Well, let's learn how to code. I'd be like, hell no. Cause the people are yeah. competition that's been doing it for 10, 15 years. Is yeah. Like, I we just have don't, no well, I don't have the time or the energy yeah. to freaking learn to code. I just don't. I barely have the time and energy to learn grammar. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, I am who I am at yeah. this point, you know? And so, but, and then, you know, but you also have like work life balance. You know what I mean? Like I have three kids and a wife. You know, and I want to enjoy certain things. I want to go on vacations and trips and do things right. And if you really want to have like your main business and start a side business, like you have to put all your extra time in that side business. It becomes like your mistress. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And I'm just, I'm just, it doesn't always work out very well. I mean, you hear success stories, but they're one in a million. You know what I'm saying? It's much better to just dive in and go really, really hard in your business and then invest in a couple buckets along the way and do that smart. And that's why it's good to have like mentors. That doesn't restrict my time. That- yeah, it doesn't restrict your time. And it's good to have mentors, right? Where you can say, hey, I'm thinking about building a stock portfolio. What are you guys building? Like, oh, these are the three stocks that I'm buying, right? Or get, like I started an investing group with like a bunch of bros that just got together every quarter and we're just like, hey, what do you guys think about this? Oh, let's do this. You know, we'll just put some money in here and this is what I'm kind of getting myself into. So you can kind of, you're getting educated in the market in a couple of things, you know? But then, but then you really just stick to what you're good at. Mm-hmm. Like speaking of Aaron Wagner, like so, I got invested with Aaron in um, those three restaurant concepts. So we were putting 30 restaurants up, right? I just gave him money. I'm not doing a damn thing. He's doing all of it. For right? you, His for company's the time, doing all of it. For you to try and do all the research and everything. Oh, come up with like a concept? Yeah, boof. No way would I do that. Piggyback off some of that. Like yeah. they have the knowledge. They have everything. So it's the same as like if someone were trying to. You had an idea or something with your turf company and stuff yeah. it'd be a lot easier if someone was like hey mark here's money you have your yeah. new concept for your turf you want to do instead of them trying to learn everything from square one it's <laughs> yeah and see in turf for me what happens with turf turf is a product that i can push inside my company already right mm-hmm. so really 
And that's why I say I'm focusing on that business because I can take other product lines and put them in that business. It's got the structure, it's got the capital, it's got the, the systems that I like, and I just keep on adding things into there. Like we added like in-wall tables like 10 years ago, one of my really good employees, um, in fact, he basically runs the business now, but he ended up um, uh, just adding that as a product line. It's those cafeteria tables, right? Like in elementary schools that push into the wall. Uh-huh. And we sell tons of them now. Right, but it, it matched kind of what we were doing, and now turf. We've done a couple of football fields down in Texas, and you know now I'm starting to talk to like like Real Madrid, right? Like I'm, it, it's still like kind of weird to me. I'm dealing with like the greatest sports franchise ever, <sighs> and because of my history in the and being honest with people and, and and building relationships, they're like, no, you're the guys that I want to do my turf, and it's like, okay, you know what I mean? And it's like, yeah, we do turf. I can do this. You know what I mean? But it fits inside that wheelhouse. So it's very easy for me to go hard in there and make it work. Right. Where if, but if I had never touched turf in my life and I worked at a software company and they're like, Hey, can you get turf for us? I'd be like, "Mm, no, you know what I mean? Like it would take you so many hours to go figure that out. It just wouldn't be worth it. And so you know, but I don't know through social media, people just have this, this opinion that you have to be diversified. And I really don't believe in that. I think you need to be connected and networked and do a damn good job at what you're good at, no matter what that is. And then just invest along the way. I mean, that's, that's the formula. hundred percent, hundred percent. No, because everyone, as we started, our business started blowing up and then a lot of people, um, family and friends said, okay, yeah, start buying into crypto and start studying real estate and start, but how many hours we're working to just grow this one company? It's like, if I try to, we're already working 80, 100 hours just on this one business. If we're only working 40, then the business, this business will die. And one solid income is better than five shitty ones. Exactly. So it's... <laughs> And that's what it will be. If yeah. you spread yourself too thin, you're not a freaking genius like Elon Musk, right? You'll have five shitty incomes. And really what you'll have is you might make money in two of them. The other three eat the money from the other businesses and you don't make any money, mm-hmm. you know? And then, you, you know, after five years, you're so burnt out. You don't give a shit. You know what I mean? It's just, yeah. it's just it ends up just being like, ugh, you know, like, I don't know how people do this. And you start becoming cynical, right? Instead of like, well, if you'll just reset, focus on the one build that as hard and as fast as you can, you'll start finding success and joy and that will bring you more energy, right? And mm-hmm. then you just plug the energy back into there and then everything else that you do. And it just keeps... And you end up being happy instead of like downtrodden and crazy. Yeah, exactly. And because then you're... And you can't keep up with people then if... Because everyone else is already... Has a short attention span and is doing like 20 different things. Yeah. So it's like... exactly. I guess exactly like the mutual fund and the compound interest. If one guy's dead set 100 hours a week on one business the other guy's only putting 20 hours this week 20 hours next week 20 hours the week after that after five weeks he only has yeah the same amount of work that the other guy did in one week so it's like yeah you've put that over five years there's no way they can keep up and i feel absolutely i feel that's how we've for this the growth that we've had and i feel that's where it's been is because we've always just been dead set on just trying to build it up our goal is our goal is 10 mil but i like uh 30 mils uh <laughs> it's a different game of 30 mil but yeah but dude 10 mil is a great goal you gotta have steps mm-hmm. you know what i mean but yeah get to 10 mil you know what you want to do with your business you got to get to a point where you have enough revenue coming in that's stable that makes your your business valuable so i tell everybody that you got to get your you got to get your revenue to 20 million before you can sell right and so, because 20 million makes you attractive, and that number actually might be higher now because we have inflation, but um, at 20 million, it's very easy to sell your business. You, you, you have enough um, net profit at the end of the day that they can say, okay, you have, say 20 million, so you have a 10% net margin, right? So you have, you know, $4 million. So, no, 10, T- four. If it's two, 20 million, two million, it's two million. Jeez Louise, two million dollars, right? So then you can say, well, I like his business. He's got all these clients. You know, I'm going to say it's worth three times what is what that is, right? So it's worth you know six million dollars if I'm doing my math right. Finally, you know, and it's like, yeah. And then you can go like, yeah, I'll take six million bucks, you know. And like, if you if you were to sell your business right now for six million dollars, you know, six million might be enough to you know pay off a bunch of debt, invest some stuff, be able to live off that investment, and technically you could be retired. Now you wouldn't because you're you know a 26 year old young man who's driven. 
then you just get into the next thing, right? And then you go crazy in that thing and then sell that thing. And then you go crazy in the next thing and sell that thing. That's really the best way to, to really grow wealth. So in my private equity fund, right? People ask us like, we're, we're very, we're very special in the fact that we don't charge fees, right? Because we're all wealthy partners, right? We don't actually need to live off, you know, fees at the beginning. We want to, we want to share in right. profits at the end, right? But for us to make money, we have to exit deals, right? We can live mm -hmm. off dividends if we're in those deals, but we're in, we're in a, in a deal right now, um, a software deal or a software company deal. We'll only make money when that company goes public, right? So we're very highly motivated to get that thing sold. But then, you know, so, so, so say we're get 20 X on that, right? So we put, you know, $10 million in, we'll get $200 million back. We'll split that with the investors. And then now we have $200 million of capital that we can go into other deals with. So you just keep mm -hmm. on rolling that capital into more and more deals. And as long as you don't really lose that often, you'll lose sometimes, right? Cause it's, it's just the game in this life, right? You'll invest in something that'll die. But you know, as long as you keep on compounding that money, I mean, that's how you get like exponentially wealthy. You know? Yeah. And so we want to be in deals for three to five years at the max, like five years. I'm like itching to get the hell out of that deal because I want the exit. I want the cash. I wanted to go into the next deal. I don't want to sit there and run some legacy business. You know what I mean? Like, I don't want my kids to follow in my footsteps per se. I don't want them to just like run one of the businesses that I have. I mean, that's, it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world, but for them, it's like, if you understand that you want to buy businesses, grow them, sell them, buy them, grow them, sell them. Like that is like the best way to just kind of like really, really grow your wealth. So in my opinion. So is yours most, so for the private equity, so then it's focused on supporting a business like financially and taking like a majority stake then, and then advising minority stake and just mm -hmm. advising them and then yeah, we'll, scale it up. Yeah. Yeah. We want to go to businesses that just need cash to grow. Right. So they come to us and they say, Hey, we're at, you know, $40 million in revenue. If, um, it's for easy math, you know, you give us $10 million, we we'll give you 10% of the business that $10 million we're going to put in these places. And it'll actually take us from $40 million in revenue to $80 million in revenue. So then we double our investment, mm -hmm. right? Our, our, our equity position will be worth twice as much as we originally came in with over X period of time. That's kind of the, the simple equation that we look at, right? Is there any like specific niche niches or businesses or business sizes that you yeah, we won't, we won't do anything in? small. We don't want to do, I would like our minimum investment to be probably $10 million per investment, right? So, um, and that could be a wider range of things. It could be a hundred million dollar business that does hundred million dollars in revenue, but it could be a $30 million in business in revenue that we're actually, you know, buying maybe 40% of it or something like that. We don't ever want to take majority stake because I don't want to run it. It's the mm -hmm. exact same thing, I right? Mean. I don't want to come in and, and buy a business and then run that business. You know, I want to come in as a semi-passive investor. We take board seats. So if the company doesn't have a board, we make them form a board and then we take a third of the seats no matter what. Right. So even if we own 10% of the business, your money putting in, but you want to it, make the call on what yeah. it's being spent on. And it's not only that we want to make the call, we want to advise at a level where they're not going to do something stupid. Right. Mm. And so, and, and stupid is not like they're dumb people that they're not going to make a stupid mistake because we have experience that we can come in and say, no, don't do that. Do it this way. That'll save you tons of money on taxes or something like this. And it helps the business grow. We want to, we literally want to advise you in a very positive way. Um, honest, organic way, not a, not a, we're the hawk looking to make sure you don't make a mistake. Then we come in and smash the business. Like we want to help the business grow. It's our money that's going in this business. We so they're essentially like paying for your guys' experience. Yeah. Oh yeah. So they don't have to Yeah. lose the $5 million and like, oh, we should have did this. It was like one change that you and your board, like, no, don't do that yet. Yeah. Do this. Yeah. Like, like where to incorporate, like, um, you know, like different things like that, right? Like it makes a lot of sense to be like in Delaware or Wyoming or Nevada for certain things, right? And just like the kind of, like the type of contracts they take down, right? So say it was a, say it was a construction company, right? And they wanted to jump into like industrial, um, like building a power plant, right? Where mm -hmm. their bread and butter is actually in commercial. It's like, no guys, you're not going to jump into that because here's all the requirements in that world that you don't currently have. Let's just go grab more commercial contracts or education contracts or recreation and, and we'll stay in that lane more instead of trying to diversify out and get into things that you don't quite understand yet. Right. Like guys that do like power plants and like, you know, bridges and the stuff like that. Those are very, very powerful general contractors. And there's not that much of that work to do. There's a ton of other stuff to do. 
right? Mm -hmm. And so it's like, how quickly are we going to affect the market? Those are the, more of the conversations we're going to have instead of just like, we're going to go to a board meeting every quarter and just look at the P&L and, and if they're not doing something right, then we're going to fire the CEO because we're, we control the board. Like that's not, that's not the way we're going to do it. We're going to basically just like, we want to help advise them and just help that, that business move. So does that make sense? Yeah, no, I, no, <laughs> I'm soaking it all in. Cause it's just yeah. interesting seeing, um, seeing it that way. Cause a lot of the mentors I have, they see it from that exact yeah. point of view as well. And so it's just cool studying and seeing like, okay, at different levels of the game, this is how yeah. people at this, at the top level see business and see how it's played. Yeah. I always picture like as a little house and you want that house to become an office building. So the house is kind of start off with, you know, like a CEO, a couple of employees, right? Then you want to take where they're at and move them to like a commercial building inside this little building where it's like layers, it's like sales here, marketing here, you know, operations here, you know, R and D, whatever's in that business. And you just keep on growing each department bigger and bigger and bigger. And then we turn around and go, Hey, now we want to sell this commercial building, you know, cause obviously a five story commercial building is worth more than, you know, a $2 million house. Right. Mm -hmm. Even though the house was nice to start off with and we saw all the potential, you know, we want to move it into this world. That's just some little weird thing I do in my head. Just think but, of how we can grow it in this part. Yeah. Here. Yeah. I just want to grow it to this kind of thing. And so we also, I also love looking at businesses that are complementary, right? So if you can take, um, like let's take the solar industry for an, for, for a example, right? Go buy a solar company and then take our money, right? Or buy into a solar company. And then we take our money and go and start acquiring them. Right. And so as that, as that solar company is actually building and doing what they normally do, I would actually, I would actually take a, a responsibility to go acquire other businesses and just keep on slamming them into there. Right. Cause you can take a, an $80 million solar company, you go buy, you know, a couple more $20 million ones, right. And grow their revenue to like 140, mm. 160 million just by acquiring them and pushing them into there. Like that's the kind of, I actually love that kind of stuff. Like we would, my fund would be very interested in doing deals like that. And so but, um, but we want to deal. So the way that we pitch to our investors, our investors are all very wealthy, right? They have their real estate, they have their stock portfolio, they have managers, wealth managers. You know what I mean? They generally have a business that they either sold that was wildly successful or they're still in it. Right? So our pitch to them is, Hey, come do some medium risk, high reward stuff with us. It's deals that you're never going to get into. Right? Cause you're just, you don't know the people, you don't have the connections, you don't have the network. Our network brings these deals out that we think are fantastic. And then we say, hey, do you wanna put a million bucks or two million bucks into this $10 million deal? And they go, yeah, that deal looks great. And so then we, we raise money for a series and that series will actually go and buy that business. That's how we do it. And then you guys hold it on for the three to five years mm -hmm. and just keep giving your advice and then mm -hmm. cash out. And no, we don't always give our advice. Like the deal we just barely did, we're not, that's a really successful company. We're actually, we feel very lucky to invest in there and it's their B round of funding. They're going to go public in the next two years, we hope. And so, um, we won't have, we're actually very, very junior in that, that last deal, but it's because it's a unicorn company. It's, it's an amazing, amazing business. And so we won't have anything to do with it. We'll just sit back and let it run. Cause you just trust that mm -hmm. they know what they're doing. Yeah. And all of our investors are super comfortable with it. So they put their money in, we invested and it, we're off to the, we're off to the races. So, man, that's awesome. That's, but, but yeah, but so, but if a mom and yeah. pop company came to me and said, Hey, I own a little restaurant, you know, we need a hundred grand to grow. I'd be like, not our fund. You know what I mean? Might do that personally, but it wouldn't be the fund that mm -hmm. would actually touch that. You know, we want to do medium sized deals, you know, cause your guys' investments are more larger than yeah. what a lot of their revenue is. Yeah. So if I take, if I do a $10 million deal or a hundred thousand dollar deal and have the exact same return. I make way more money on $10 million than I do on a hundred thousand. It's just, it just doesn't have the scale. It doesn't have the scale of economies. And then I guess you get really good at just providing that same kind of, um, advice for that specific niche. Then instead of yeah, yeah, trying to do the whole spectrum of business yeah, or introducing people, you know, like, yeah. like if we had someone that want to do some sort of a real estate, um, like some commercial development deal with us. Like I have a lot of guys that do that in my network. So I'd go to them and say, Hey, what do you guys think about this? And they'd be like, Oh yeah or nay. You know, we think that's good. We don't think that's good, you know? And maybe we end up partnering on it. Right. Maybe I take some of my friends and this new company and be like, Hey, I want these guys to advise you. You need to do a joint venture and then we'll invest. You know, we just, you just build these deals very integrately, but like, um, 
but with people you trust and that you kind of have that honesty level there. Right. And it, it actually pushes down the risk because you can, you can JV people into deals and then I go back to my investors and say, Hey, we've got these guys. I really, really trust with these guys that I think could do really well. And you put them together and then they end up doing a deal and then bam, it does really well. And you're great. So, Man. yeah, <laughs> but for someone, so say, yeah. you, you know, say you made $25 million, right? Sold your business. You're 40 now. You know what I mean? And you have guys like me and you're like, Hey Mark, I want to put some money in your fund. Cause you've done really well. Well, and I like the way that you put deals together. And I'm not going to go out there and search and find deals like this. And I don't want to sit at my desk and take all the risk of figuring out this deal and getting the parties together and making it all work. Cause I always have two or three deals just in the hopper. Right. And you want to retire and you want to go surf or you want to go take your family on a month long vacation. Right. And so you like, you ask me, Hey, what, what deals do you have? I say, I got these three deals. They're like, cool. I'll put a mill in each one of those do good work for me. I'm like, cool. And then we hug and bro out and you wire the money. And then every quarter you get a, a little email from me that says how the investment's doing. And, when you ex- when we exit the deals, we take all the money, we split it, we send you your portion of the of the investment, and then then you come back to me and say, hey, cool, I made a couple million bucks in that last one. I want to put more in with you. Cool. Here's the three deals that I have, and you just pick the ones that you like. And and, and then your network that just keeps growing because then it's you just keep meeting other people yeah. in their circle, and then after you do a good job, and he's like, yeah, look how much I made with Mark and his fund, and then yeah, his buddies are hitting you up. Exactly. They tell their friends, you just do good business. You, all I get, honestly, all I have to do is be honest. That's the only thing I have to do at this point to grow that business is just be honest with everybody that I'm involved in. That's it. As long as I never lie, I'm good. The guys that lie end up getting screwed. Mm-hmm. You know, even if a deal goes bad, right? If you invest in three deals, one goes bad, but you, you know, five extra money than the other two, you still made way more money than you would have in the stock market or yeah. on a commercial building you bought that you're the freaking tenant or that you're the landlord on you know what i mean it's just it's just a good way to do business so and it, everyone wins yeah the business that you guys invested it in the investors win you guys win yeah and so it's hopefully what yeah, yeah. But i'm not saying there's <laughs> yeah. no risk in this right that's why i say it's medium risk but it's but they're fun they're fun deals they're just deals you're not going to see and you know i mean we've looked uh, like we looked at an application um that this group is building and we actually gave them a letter of intent it's for 10 million dollars it, it's it's, bu- it's building an application that's like coinbase but with like a social media uh portion to it mm-hmm. and they have all these celebrity influencers that are part of this like big massive collabor- collaboration collaboration and um you know they got to put some pieces in place right but as they keep on putting these pieces in place and they build this app and they do all this stuff and they're highly qualified people right actually one of my friends, Stephen Mata, he's actually going to end up being on the podcast here in the next couple of months. And he'll talk about this, I'm sure. But he, uh, you know, then I go to my investors and I'm like, Hey, we're getting in on a deal that you will never see. Right. Because I ended up meeting the developer through like two friends. Right. It was like, Hey, meet my friend. Hey, meet my friend. Hey, meet this developer. Right. And he's done awesome stuff in the past. He was on Apple's, um, he was on an Apple TV show called like I was going to kill me because he's told me like five times, but it's, it's basically an app developing company. He took fourth place on it or something like that. and got famous in that world. You know what I mean? But like, it's because me and some of my partners, like we're out in the world meeting people and talking to people. And, you know, I'm not afraid to engage anybody. You know, I mean, you've come to the office and I'm like, yeah, this is what I think you need to do with your business. And I don't expect anything in return. You know what I mean? It's just mm-hmm. like, Hey, here's some free advice. I kind of help you. And then, you know, later on it's like, Hey, this dude gave me some good advice and I kind of like him and I've listened to his podcast and, I want to see what this guy's more about. You know what I mean? And that's what I mean. Like at this point, I just have to be honest with people and be like, these are the things that we're doing. These are the things we've won on. These are the things we've lost on. And yeah, if you want to come and participate in this world, I, I try my best. Come on, come try it. You know, that's the pitch. Exactly. So. That's no, I love that. Cause if you burn bridges, it's cause it's all the same circle. Yeah. You burn bridges, then that you just ruined it for you. Cause now the same way, the goodwill that you're, Word of mouth is like, oh, invest with Mark. Yeah. You can flip the script quickly. He's like, oh, don't invest with Mark. Yeah, that dude screwed me. And he's full of shit. <laughs> yeah. Like, my goal in life is to never have anyone say that out of their mouth, whether they like me or not. Like, they may be, he's a douchebag, mm-hmm. and I don't like you who he is, but he does do honest business. Like, that's like, oh, that's a win for me. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. not everyone's going to love you because everyone's got their own flavor, right? But it's like, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> I don't think there's one person on this planet that can say that I've screwed him. So... So that's that's a lot more important than no. Oh, that's awesome because everyone's not gonna like you, or like some people will like you, some people will hate you. But yeah, yeah. that's that's awesome. That's undeniable. It's like you can't say yeah, I was dishonest. You can't say it. 
I stole. I cheated. Yeah. It's like, nope, I did right by everyone. Yeah. And that's the advice I give to people all the time, you know? It's like even with you, with your concrete company, right? It's like you will meet some some clients that are going to try and screw you if mm-hmm. they haven't already, right? Mm-hmm. Well, and yeah. it's like, and that's that's, those are moments that you have to decide how you're going to handle that, right? You know? And, um... I mean, in, in my backstop company, right? Like we've actually threatened people. Like we will come and rip these backstops out of your building if you do not pay us, right? And we were actually, and we mean it. I will go and do that. I mean, we have trucks and trailers and scissor lifts. Like I'll pull freaking six backstops out of a building in two hours. You know what I mean? We had one guy in California, dude. We were literally loading the trucks, right? We were like running the hotel because it was like this. And it was like, dude, it was like a year. He just would not pay us, would not pay us, right? For no reason. And, um, and using the gym and like having revenue to run through his gym. You know what I mean? And, um, finally, uh, I think it was my dad cause he was involved in the business back then. He ended up talking to the landlord of the building that he was renting it from. And the guy was like, Hey, I understand that you're trying to collect these bills and you're going to come pull this stuff out. And my dad was like, absolutely. And the guy goes, don't do that. I'll pay for it. And he literally wired us the money that day. And I was like, really? that is wild, you know? But at the same time, but my point with that is it's like, you're going to have some shit clients you got to go handle mm-hmm. business with. You know what I mean? You're not going to freaking, you know, key their car or anything, but you're going to go do what you need to do, mm-hmm. you know? And more often than not, you're just going to do the honest thing. And as long as you do the honest thing in your gut, whatever that is, you'll be fine. You know? Yeah. yeah I really believe that. I think that you, as long as you, you know, Ryan and I were just talking about this in the last podcast, right? It's like, you just got to go with your gut, man. Just mm-hmm. do it. You know, trust people that's kind of the funny thing in business, right? You have to trust people. You, you, you can't get away from that. You ha- you actually have to choose to trust people. And if you get burned, you get burned. And, but most of the time, if you trust people and you're honest, everything will work out. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's exactly what me and my brother were talking about yesterday is because there was, there's a job, a client um, called us because me and my brother both were there. We thought the job went smoothly, everything. And he sent us photos, all the, it was all cracked and whatnot, um, but it was already past the warranty date. And then, so me and my brother were like, it's like, well, we have to go fix it. Like, I don't know what we did wrong, but we can't. Yeah, we did that. So like, I don't know what, what it is. We could come up with a million reasons. We can blame like, oh, it was probably the supplier or it was probably this or like, actually, we're not liable to fix it, but... It was just that integrity thing is like, well, that's our name right there. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> that, you never know, dude. I mean, you could go and not fix that and he could bad mouth you to a bazillion people. You never know. He might be the accountant for latent construction. Then you go mm-hmm. try and get a job and he's bad mouth and you don't even know. Right. Mm-hmm. Or the other side is, is it's like, Hey, we'll fix this. Or you work a deal out. Right. It's like, Hey man, this past your warranty. If you pay for the materials, we'll do the labor for free or you come up with something. Right. So it's equitable for both right. sides. Right. And then, you know, as long as they're happy with it, then it's like, you know, he could still, he could be the, you know, uh, accountant for Leighton and go yeah. and tell them and be like, Hey, I worked with this concrete company and they're actually really good dudes. And they, they messed something up and we worked out a deal. And I was actually really happy with them. You might want to look at them you know, and then it opens you up to, you know, exactly. half a million dollars in revenue. And, the, and then, cause we, you know? we, the way we thought of it is, okay, if we don't fix it and we just say our, it's not our problem, that driveway is a $10,000 driveway. It's like, so we just bought our, our integrity is only worth $10,000. Yeah. So it's been bought. Right. It's like, I don't want to have that. We don't want to have, you, you can't buy us to cheat. You can't pay us to cheat or steals. Like, yeah, no, let's just go fix it. And like, yeah, and I so love that just, dude. We're I just love honest that. about him. He's, we were honest. Like we can't get to it this season. Cause it's already, the season's pretty much all wrapped up, but start of next season. Yeah. Yeah. And so like, we're just going to have to, bite that bullet because of yeah that that me and my brother were saying and we're we like it. it's it's tough but it's no we like yeah you, gotta, you, gotta you sleep better up. at night you sleep a lot better at night yeah i sleep like a baby <laughs> <laughs> i always joke with people because of my cpap machine you know i'm freaking old enough to have <laughs> one of those damn things but yeah but no you're right you got to be able to sleep at night dude you got to be able to look in the mirror and be like yeah i'm an honest bro you know at the end of the day that's all you got mm-hmm. so well, hey, my friend, I need to get two minutes of your best advice. Go. Ready, go. Best advice is surrounding yourself with people that you really want to 
be like and be with and like that help you grow because i you never really understand how much your circle changes you and the things you pick up and everyone thinks that they can oh yeah i'm around these guys but no i'm i'm stronger or whatever it's so we've i've learned that i've had to cut a lot of people out of my life that were negative in order to grow in in life and it's at a point it is sad but at the same time it's like well you pick what you want if i hang around if i hang around five alcoholics i'll become the sixth alcoholic if i hang around five millionaires i'll be the sixth millionaire and so it's like that's the my best advice is i would constantly give to everyone just be mindful of who you're around and just surround yourself with people like that and you'll always just keep growing you'll be you'll be happy with where you are and you can't point fingers because at the end of the day you pick who you're with oh absolutely that's 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 very good advice it really is so well my friend thanks for coming on the podcast awesome sounds good thanks for listening to the president mccormack podcast brought to you by mccormack foundation saxton fund adp lemco and professional floor systems Make sure you subscribe to the podcast and keep up with Mark on Instagram at President McCormack.